podcast is a blog term podcast about the realities of life, what's trending, being a mom and a wife, family, career, and everything in between. I hope you enjoy this next episode, but please make sure that you follow us on Instagram at realities, and that is R-A-I-A-L-I-T-I-E-S. Let us know what you think about this next episode. Enjoy. Welcome to Realities. We are back. Say hi, G. Hi, G. <laughs> she always says it at the beginning. <laughs> so we are continuing our conversation this month about investing, and we have a guest with us all the way from California. We are excited to have her. We will allow her to introduce herself and tell our listeners what she does and who she is. Hi. Thank you for having me. So my name is Ursula Garrett, and I'm a certified public accountant, and I have a CPA firm in Menifee, California. And I've had this firm for over 20 years. I work with entrepreneurs and small business owners. And what I call myself is a tax expert, a tax advisor. So if you want to avoid paying taxes or minimize the amount of taxes you pay, I'm your girl. Awesome. I love it. So there are a couple things I know I wanted to talk about. I'm pretty sure um, that G wanted to talk about as well. Um, Every year... Of course, there are tax changes, um, t- things that change the taxpayers need to just be aware of. Um, then we also have just some some people that just aren't aware of just what to do for tax season, how to prepare in advance. Um, so I wanted to start there. Like, what do you how do you prepare for, you know, filing taxes, meaning like for us? I keep a folder with the year on it, the tax year on it. So for example, 2021 tax season and anything that I can remember that is taxable. So receipts and things like that and um, daycare stuff, I drop it in that HSA receipts, whatever I drop in that folder Mm -hmm. um, so that when the time comes, I can just grab that folder. I have a little check off sheet um, and take it, send it off to Mm -hmm my tax advisor. So for you, what it, what is, what do you think, how should one prepare for tax season? And that, that's actually a good idea. That's actually what I do when my forms come in, I just drop them all in a folder, but the best thing to do is most tax preparers will give you what's called an organizer and you can have the, they either print it and mail it out. So I have a lot of clients that still aren't as digitally inclined. So I print them out. In fact, mine are going out this week. Um, So we send them an organizer. And what the organizer is, it's it's kind of a look back. It shows you all the things that you had on your tax return the year before. So it kind of helps you. It jogs your memory. Okay, last year I had wages from this company and this company. And, um, you know, there are some people that have five to 10 W-2s. And they may not remember all of them, all the places where they get these W-2s. And, oh, I quit that job. I forgot about that one, but I still got a check in January. So the organizer is really good for things like that. You think you have everything together, you go file your taxes and you come home and you find another form in your mailbox. Has is, is that ever happened to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> all the time. Oh, yeah. Yes, and then right. I'm sitting there like, well, how could that have helped me? <laughs> yeah. So, so that's how organizers help. Now, a lot of my clients now get them digitally. So I send them a link and they can go in it and it has their organizer digitally. And as they upload it, it keeps saying, okay, this is submitted, this is submitted. So this thing is complete and it'll show the red mark. And either you have to say, no, I didn't have that this year or something like that, or you're still waiting on on getting it. So an organizer is probably the best way to keep your information. And if your tax preparer doesn't automatically send it to you, then you could just call and ask them. If you do it yourself, if you're preparing your taxes yourself, well, I don't recommend that, but if you're doing it yourself and you're comfortable, <laughs> then what you have to do is, is go through, um, like let's say you're using one of these, let's use TurboTax for instance. It'll have all the information from the year before if you sign in, you have your login. So they have, So it's the same thing as an organizer and it will ask you for that information. So you always want to use the prior year's information to help you get organized for the year. Um, and then always organize your records. Just keep everything straight. If, if you started a business during a year, even if you're not good at doing spreadsheets, doing accounting, 
throw everything in an envelope, throw it in the envelope by the month do whatever you have to, but keep your records organized because good records are gonna be your key to not paying all the taxes that, that you could avoid. Uh, I wanna say schedule your tax appointment early this year. Um, the IRS was already short staffed and Who is now it? they have people out with COVID mm -hmm. and other things and they still have a lot of employees that are working from home. So if you thought things were slow before, they're even slower now. And so you're finding that um, if you go in late, let's say um, you are you don't get your stuff in by say March 15th, you may not get your taxes prepared by April 15th. I know in my office, and I thought it was just me and I'm like, I'm overwhelmed. We have all these taxes, all these people need. And it's like pull and teach sometimes to get the information. And if I have to spend my time dragging the information out of you, that's going to slow it up, not just for you, but everybody else that's waiting to be done. And I heard from a lot of my colleagues and other people in the industry, that was industry-wide. It wasn't just a me thing, that was an everybody thing. Um, a lot of people started new businesses, they didn't know what they were doing, so they needed a lot of help in getting all of their information. So if you're unsure, uh, the first thing is, if you wait until January, to start getting ready for your taxes, you're already behind the curve. You should be preparing for your taxes. For 2022, you should start preparing now. Start doing your tax planning now. This is why people end up owing taxes because they don't plan for taxes all year long. Taxes aren't going anywhere and you know you're gonna have to pay them. So if you start doing your tax planning all year long, my clients that wanna know, especially my business clients, I work with them all year. So when December ends, when somebody's saying happy new year, they already know what their tax, their tax end is. They know if they owe how much, if they're getting a refund, how much, but most of my business clients don't really get refunds unless they just <laughs> overpaid in their estimated payments. But that's not a surprise. Filing their taxes is just a matter of being compliant. They've already planned for it. They've done everything they can to minimize the taxes they owe. And so we use tax strategies and we implement those all year long. And so if your main goal is to pay as little taxes as possible, then that's what you have to do. You have to do your tax planning all year long. And some people look at it and say, oh, that's so expensive. Yeah, is it really though? At the end of it, when you have to pay Uncle Sam, you should have just paid right. Ursula <laughs> to save you. <laughs> it, exactly, so you know, there's, so let me give you an extreme case. So I have a client who, had it, um, an LLC and he was selling stuff online. And for 2019, he had the LLC. I think he formed it in like 18. So 18 and 19 didn't have a lot of income. It was just kind of moseying along. In 2019, it blew up. He made over $2 million. Oh, wow. And this is basically online sales with very few expenses. Wow. In December, November, December, he's like, oh, what am I going to do? Well, here's the deal. You're an LLC. So number one, 100% of your income is subject to self-employment taxes as an LLC. Number two, you're in, so that put, and then that puts you in addition to self-employment taxes, then you're paying um, at the highest tax bracket, 37% tax bracket. Because he had another job, which was his full-time job where he earned money, he earned wages. But he's in the 37% tax bracket for federal. In California, then he's in the 13.3%. So the 13.3 and the 37%, that are already puts him over 50%, plus the self-employment taxes on- um, he, just, he owe more than what he made. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Right. But with some tax planning, we were able to- get his taxes down to below uh, below $200,000 as opposed to being over $500,000. Oh, that's good. And we could have done more had we started planning earlier in the that year and implementing year. some strategies. So the moral of that story is plan you have it. to plan for it. Yeah. Um, but here's, he was going to somebody that did his taxes 
And I think they charged him, what, $2,500. They were going to charge him $2,500 to do his taxes. His business taxes were, okay, fine. And he came to me and I said, no, it's, it's going to cost you $35,000. Well, that's a lot of money. I said, okay, so you can go to this person and you can pay him $2,500 and you can pay $500,000 in taxes. Paying the same. <laughs> you can come to me and you pay $35,000 but you pay 150,000 in taxes. Tell me who's costing you more money. Yeah. So it's just a matter of how you look at it. I don't just do tax preparation. I do uh, tax advisory, tax planning. We come up with strategies to help you save money. So if you don't think my services are worth it, then you don't pay it. You, you can go somewhere else. Now that, now that one was an extreme case. That one was one on the high end and I have maybe a half dozen clients in that case where the pandemic happened and their businesses did really well. So we had to implement some strategies. And you know, one of the biggest one, and it's always been around is the income shifting. You wanna shift income to lower tax brackets. And that's what we do. We come up with a plan where you shift income to lower um, tax brackets. One how of the things- I'm about to say, how do you do that though? Like, okay, I know so, this never this before a longer conversation, but- Well, I'll give you a quick like example. The more money you make, the more, more options you have. <laughs> oh, okay. That's so it. for example, with this young man, as an LLC, he had to pay all that money in self-employment taxes. One way that we were able to reduce his taxes is we formed a C corporation, which has a flat tax bracket of 21%. Hmm. And that corporation okay. became a management company to his LLC. So his LLC paid the management company a management fee. So that way you're shifting that income from a 50% tax bracket to a flat 21% tax bracket. And you know how you can make that and get rid of the 13%. Well, actually corporations for California, the tax rate is 8.84. So you would be moving it from 37% federal, 13.3% California into 21 federal, roughly 9% to California. So that moves you into 30% as opposed to 50%. But if you wanted to go one step further, if you formed your management corporation in a state, say like Nevada, that doesn't have a state income tax, then you get rid of that 13% and that 9% and you just pay a flat 21% in Nevada instead of the 50 plus percent if you had your business here in California. I need to go somewhere that don't have no state tax. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, um, as as you're talking, I'm I'm listening. You you um, you said that everyone should have no one should do their their own. Oh, I'm like about to say this. So, <laughs> no, that's not what I said. Wait, no, she's, I it? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, she said but if I you said do it, was, then... I don't recommend that most people prepare their own taxes My on it. If all you have is a W-2 and you don't have much more and you understand what you're doing now, that's fine. That's but what I was going to ask. Yeah, yeah if you're ask. It's like for a person who is single and all they have is their job and maybe a mortgage, is it still a good idea to have um, to have a financial, uh, someone to do their taxes or is it okay for them to do it? do the turbo tax or absolutely if you understand what you're doing absolutely yeah. do it yourself using a turbo tax or some other why pay three four hundred dollars for somebody to pay your taxes when you're just dropping your w-2 in and you don't have much going on Agreed. but if you're more complicated if you have a business unless you understand the tax laws and your business is profitable i don't recommend doing it yourself if yeah. you have a lot of complicated complex i shouldn't say complicated complex transactions and you don't really understand um, taxes to that extent because you know you're good at what you do, but taxes aren't your thing. Yeah. Then maybe turbo taxes. And I've had people that do their taxes on turbo tax, and they come in to see me, and I take a look at the last three years, and sometimes I see they took all kinds of deductions and put stuff on there, and I said, you know what? It's just a matter of time before you get a letter. I said you could just let it ride and hope you don't get that letter. But when you get the letter, you're going to have penalties and interest, or you can go ahead and amend now and fix it. But then there are other times when they do it themselves and they don't take all the deductions that they're entitled to and all the credits. 
-hmm. And so they're entitled to a refund. And I usually say, hey, here's how much your refund is going to be. Do you want to amend your returns? Is that a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> I know I, I know when I was when I when I was one of those just one W2 type of people, <laughs> that's all I had was just that one W2, just, just the job. I didn't have nothing, no, none of the other complexities that we talk about. Uh -huh. Then for me, it was like, okay, I can do this myself. I'm not gonna pay nobody. And I've, you know, been been fine. Mm -hmm. Um, I think once I got married and you know. The comp that's when everything started, <laughs> you know, my eyes started crossing. I was like, yeah, let me stick to what I know best. Mm -hmm. um, and that's right. HR. <laughs> I'm not going to stick to, not going to mess around with this. And uh, I'm glad I didn't, you know, try, try to do it because I wanted to for a minute. But, you know, with you getting to, you know, stocks and, and, and cashing out your stocks and doing this and doing that. And then um, just... It's, it's just a whole lot that goes into investments and all of that. And I'm like, I don't know, what, what am I supposed to be putting on this line? <laughs> yeah. And things change so much. And if you're not, if you're not um, up to date with the tax changes and the tax laws, mm -hmm. then it's jacking yourself up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that happens. But you know what? Um, a lot of people recognize, you know, they start getting those letters from the IRS. They go, okay, I think I'm in over my head. Let oh, me go yeah. in and see somebody. So when you realize you're, and and hopefully you, most people realize they're in over their head before they start getting those letters. <laughs> oh yeah. And I've been audited. We've been audited before. So, mm -hmm. and we had a tax prepare. Mm -hmm. We we was audited and I was about ready to wring her neck when I was like, you know what? You signed it at the end of the day, whether you understood it or not, your is your signature that's at the bottom of that paper. Although they did end up, she still got in trouble for whatever because it was way too many of us getting audited but that's yeah oh you went to one of those so let me tell you we run into those from time to time these people that set up office and they help their clients get big refunds so every year i probably get about a half dozen of those or so where mm -hmm. somebody said oh you could take this and they have all these deductions they get these huge refunds and i said you know what had you just done it right you would have gotten a refund it would not have been that large but you would have gotten a refund. Yeah. So now what's going to happen is they go, and once they go back one year and find an issue, they're going to go back, they're gonna go back. Yep. three more years. They're going to keep going back as long as they can to collect this money. Yep. And uh, I've seen people where they've, the federal marshals have come out and they've padlocked doors for people that, wow. that, that uh, prepare fraudulent returns like that. You can't. Wow. So they, yeah, and I, I was like, go get her, getting, <laughs> go get her. <laughs> Oh yeah, they will cost their me some on money. Large refunds, <laughs> and now and now after that, I told my husband, I don't want a refund. Just to make it even, just to make me eat, like I clean this. I balanced, <laughs> like that's all I want. I don't want to. I don't want a refund. I really don't want to owe Uncle Sam. But if I if I gotta pay him a dollar, I pay him a dollar. But yeah, I'd rather. I don't like to owe. I think that after yeah, because I'm just we're the same way, like. We we didn't owe for the longest time. Um, I purchased a house in my early 20s and um, it didn't go the way I, it was supposed to go. So by the time I had rented it out and everything, by the time um, the renters were done with it, it I was like, I'm done. I don't care what y'all do with it. Y'all can smoke it. Y'all can drink it. Y'all can do whatever y'all want to do with it. I don't want the house anymore. Mm -hmm. So I walked away from it. And of course that put us, um, that put at that time, it was, it's still me and my husband, but it put us in a situation. And my dad is the person who does our taxes. We've never owed before then. Um, that was in 2013. We're still, we're just getting that money back because they were saying they didn't get paperwork for it. And then because they went into that and looked into that and then gave us the money, eventually gave us the money back for that. We ended up owing every year after that because that was that mess. That wasn't that was taxable. Possible. Yeah, you didn't pay yeah. taxes on it. So it was, it's, I'm the same way at this point. I'm like, I don't care if we don't get anything back. Yeah, I don't need it. I've, I, I don't I, I, owe anybody. At this, once you get to a certain, and I, I hate to say, once you get to a certain tax bracket i guess it's like mm -hmm. look i can't i don't want to owe you i want every dollar <laughs> and 
And if it if it means paying my tax preparer that two thousand three thousand dollars, you can have. I will pay you in advance <laughs> to save you. We'll start installments <laughs> now. <laughs> right, right. That's part of preparing. That's part of preparing. Right, save your coins for your tax preparer. <laughs> but see, your 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 uh, fee should only get that expensive if you have a business. If you don't have a business, unless you have a lot of rental properties or something like that, which is considered having a business. Yeah, and your tax preparation fee shouldn't get to be like that. Now, yeah, if I'll if you that way, I was it wasn't. Say, it wasn't, consider, but it this year will probably be. So I was going to say, what do you consider a lot though? When you say a lot of uh, rental properties, what do you consider like is two a lot or? Mm. No. Well, it just depends. You know, there are people you can have two rental properties, but maybe your two rental properties are apartment buildings, and it depends yeah. on how good your records are. Yeah. And it depends on what state they're in. So if you live in one state and you have one rental in a different state and another rental in yet another state, then that's yeah, so you gotta, that's a that lot of record like keeping. A lot, though. Yeah, that, no, that's yeah. when it's a lot. <laughs> but but a lot, I guess. Let's say multiple. Like I have, um, and, and they've sold it off. But I used to have these clients that had maybe about twenty rental properties, and they had them all in their names. Well, actually, it was it was it was two guys and one had, um, they own these, most of the properties they own together, but one had a couple outside of the other guy. And, um, but then they, they used to file separate returns and they each had like, one had 20 and one had 18. And then they got married when the laws change. And so now I had to combine those same two returns on everything. Oh. So there was like 20, rental properties to me that's a lot yeah oh yeah they've that is. sold most of them off now and i think they're down to about six they're kind of retired and just done with the rental properties and every year they were selling off a few oh, um that's stressful but you know rental properties are something you can also use uh implement tax strategies i, I had a client that had uh, they had their home and they had two rental properties by the ocean um they were little like little condos and they knew they were going to retire. Retire. So when somebody moved out of one of the rental properties, they fixed it up. Still calling it a rental, deducting all of that as a rental. They retired. They sold their house. Were able to exclude the gain because of you know Section One Twenty One capital gain. You don't have to recognize it on your primary resident. They moved into the rental, one of the condos, and made that their primary resident. After two years, they sold that one no gain, moved into the second rental, lived in that one for a couple of years, sold it, then they came back and bought this big house oh, that's after, you know, after they retired. But, you know, they were able to sell these properties at, at large gains and not have to pay any capital gains taxes. You know, wow. if you're retired and you have nothing else to do, it, does it really hurt you to live in a property you own for a couple of years? Yeah. If it's right. going to save you uh, hundreds of thousands in um, a Taxes on hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. So I had a question getting kind of changing a little bit. Okay. So just recently, um, I don't know if you want to call it a law. They passed a law or they passed some <laughs> tax change or whatever. I know that's why I said I think I'm using the wrong term, but a tax change or they implemented a tax because it never was a change. It never was taxable. But um, with like, cash app and venmo and all of that stuff right what is it because i have seen and heard several different um explanations of what it is and then i've read and i'm like if i i don't want to read nobody's nbc washington or <laughs> i don't want to read it from there i want the irs publication number whatever <laughs> to tell well, me what it is so Everybody let me give you the skinny that. on that so that was a part of the American Rescue Plan, mm -hmm. and it it's not a new law. They just expanded the reporting. So if you sold something and somebody paid you via via Venmo or Cash App or any of that, that was always taxable. They just didn't have to report it to you. So there was no tax law change in that. So what it used to be is you won't, they only had to issue you the 1099K, which is that form that they give you when you have like credit card, you, you accept credit card payments or whatever, but it just reports how much money you've received. 
And with Cash App and Venmo and those third-party payment systems like that, they only had to report it if it was over $20,000. And they found out that a lot of sales were going unreported. So they just expanded the reporting and they made it the same as anytime you pay somebody $600 or more, you had to issue a 1099. Well, $600 for a service that they provided you. Okay. Um, to be able to deduct it, you had to issue them a 1099. So um, and then last year it was changed to a 1099 NEC for non-employee compensation. Um, and so what they're doing is they're just expanding like a lot of people weren't reporting uh, sales that when they got paid with credit cards, and this was how they were able to track it. They had to be issued a 1099-K. So now they're just expanding that, and the 1099-K is also going for Venmo and uh, Cash App and those third-party apps. So now if your grandmother sent you um, $1,000 via Venmo or Cash App, and that was a gift, obviously that's not income. So you do get to exclude money, um, some of the money from like that. But um, for the most part, they're just trying to get people to report all the money they're earning. Um, okay. And like I said, it was always taxable. People just didn't always report it. And now they're forcing you to be honest and report more of what you're earning. So then my, so my question comes in, and, and the reason why this was brought up, because every, between our families, my family and Rayshawn's family, every year we're trying, we try to do a family, a family vacation. And we have it set up to where the people can give us money and it's monthly. So it, it could look like mm -hmm. we're getting, uh, um, uh, we're getting payment. Mm -hmm. So does that, so for example, if, if Rayshawn is given, if we started in September and from September up until August of the, the next year, she's giving me $200. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's going to, well exceed the six hundred dollar limit. Does mm -hmm. that um, does that hurt? like two thousand dollars or two hundred dollars a month? So okay. Does that is that going to end up hurting me or Rayshawn for you know? Possibly, it could get reported to you as income, but there uh, and they haven't quite figured out how it's going to work. But there are ways that you're going to have to exclude money that was personal. So I think sometimes when you transfer money, it asks if it's personal or business. Yeah, when you set up Cash App, it asks you initially if it's a business or a personal. I think honestly, everybody put personal. I was going to say a lot of people probably put personal, but you know, that I I think that's that's where the 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 issue comes in because you have regular Joe Blows like us who use cash app for everything. Like my dad gives money to my kids every month. Right. But here's the deal. When they put it as personal and the business deal goes bad, they have no recourse. Uh -huh. So if somebody said, I paid you for something and I didn't receive it. And you go, no, nope, you sent it to me personally. You didn't pay me for anything. That was a gift. Oh. So, I mean, there are consequences to no matter what you do, but that's what I think that's how they're doing it. You state whether it's business or it's personal. Personally, I don't know why anybody would use Venmo or Cash App for a business transaction because there is no recourse. Once they get the money, they got that money. Cash App or Venmo isn't going to try and take it back from you. If somebody makes a report like, oh, I didn't get my, I didn't get my product. I didn't get my service. You're not going to get that money back. Cash App and Venmo, it's like you had somebody cashes. They have it now. Cash is king cash is gone <laughs> so basically i can tell i can tell my my family y'all just send me the cash app and we'll we'll deal with whatever and make sure they, exactly make sure they classify it as personal oh even though even though my account would say personal yeah okay everybody needs to classify the transaction as personal mm -hmm. if it's a personal transaction i number like i said i don't recommend using cash app and venmo for business Right. But if you do, make sure you say that as business. Yeah. For multiple reasons, you want it to say business. That makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stop using clear. it because I'm not sure. I ain't messing with the IRS. So I'm just going to shut mine down. <laughs> so don't, if you, if you it, don't it, send it me nothing, it, give me mine in cash. Right. Write me a check. I'm still a check. It makes person. you nervous. Write me a check. It makes you nervous. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to add nothing else to my taxes. <laughs> 
I'm going to bring up one other topic that I see has been happening a lot, and hopefully this is going to help somebody. Um, so it's these GoFundMe and those type of accounts where you do the fundraisers. Yes. And number one, if you give to a person, let me tell you, that's not a charity and you do not get a charity, a charitable okay. donation deduction. Number two, if you're the one that set it up, even if you're setting it up for somebody else, if you put your information in, you set it up because your sister's house burned down or a friend of yours is on hard times and they need money to bury a family member or whatever, but you're the one that set it up and put your information in guess who's getting a 1099 at the end of the year? Uh, you are. You and are. that's taxable income. Even though it had nothing to do with you, that's messed up. But you, it does, because you started. You're the it. one that set it you up and put it. your information in. Yeah. So last year I had a client who raised $25,000 for a friend who's, I think his house burnt down mm -hmm. or something like that. So he did a, a GoFundMe and, he raised $25,000. He got a 1099 at the end of the year. And he thought, oh, well, I can deduct that. That was charity. No, that was not charity. You didn't give it to a charitable organization that then gave it to him. So that, that might be one way of getting around that. You get the money as income, and then you can get the $25,000 or however you, get, you give it to a charity and let the charity give it to them. That would be one way of getting around it. Um, mm. But... Yeah, if you set up a GoFundMe and you put in your information, you're the one that's going to be taxed on it. Whoever received it, wow. doesn't really matter who you gave it to or what the purpose. Because you're the one you collecting the money. It looks, it, it looks like that's money given to you. All right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, there are ways around it for you to shift it to the person that you actually gave it to. Um, but most people are like, well... I help raise the money because they were in such dire need. Do I really need? I mean, am I going to feel right having them to pay the taxes on it? So there's always that. But yeah. what I can tell you is GoFundMe is not a, a, a financial plan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things you said, to, you um, asked me to talk about was finances and saving for the future. And yeah. so, you, you know, buy life insurance in all honesty, insure everything. So when things happen, if you have life insurance, then when somebody dies or, you know, you die or you have it on your family members, even if it's just a small burial policy, then you don't have to do a GoFundMe. If you have auto insurance, then you smash your car and, and you need something to drive, you have auto insurance, you have homeowner's insurance, you have renter's insurance. Insurance may seem expensive and you think, oh, well, I got to cut dollars here. Um, but I suggest you find a way to pay for insurance because that insurance is going to, number one, you don't pay taxes on insurance. But in the Life moment, insurance is not taxable. Not. If car insurance makes you whole, you're not going to pay taxes on that insurance money. So... Mm. So speaking of and speaking of insurance, um, my husband and I, and I'm sure Rayshawn and, and, and her husband as well, my husband and I, we have um, life insurance, but also a lot of our a lot of our companies offer, and it, it's on, it might be just a little, but it's still something. They mm -hmm. offer some mm -hmm. type of insurance, uh, uh, life insurance. But at what age, what age would you say is a good age to start? investing in like life insurance, having that, that, that cushion, that just in case. Okay. So life insurance, you should have when somebody else is depending on you, on your income. So mm -hmm. like if, if you're 20 and nobody else is depending on your income, why do you need life insurance? Maybe a small burial policy. And that may be something your parents keep on you or something like that. Or you have so that whoever your family is, um, they don't have to worry about it. But the reason you have life insurance is because you have people that are depending on your income. Yeah. If, if you were to die or become incapacitated, whatever, now your husband becomes the only source of income. And if you have kids, you know, he needs probably now that he may have to pay for more childcare or more help because you're not available, he's going to need more income. And, and the same with him, if something happens to him, 
now his income is gone and now you have you and the kids to take care of. So that's the point of life insurance is to give you security while um, to replace the income, the risk of losing um, income. Right, right. Hmm. That's the primary purpose of it. And another purpose of income is to help you um, um, build assets. We like assets. Help you build assets. <laughs> so you buy different kinds of insurance policies and um, that, that, that build up cash value. And instead of cashing it out, you borrow from the insurance policy. So you're borrowing from yourself. So I don't, I think somebody mentioned earlier about how all these really wealthy people uh, make all these, they make billions and then they qualify for earned income credit. And how do they do that? You know, how does Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk qualify for earned income credit? Because they take very modest salaries from their company, really small amount. And they have stock options. They get paid in stock options. And what do they do with those stock options? They don't cash them in. They borrow against it. And when you borrow money, borrowed money is not taxable now, is it? But, but when you think about it, if you borrowed money from your 401k plan, do you pay taxes on it? No. But no. if you take a distributions, you pay taxes and a penalty. Yep. Yep. So borrowed money is not taxable. So you build up, you buy some kind of universal life insurance policy where it builds up cash value. And if you ever need money, you borrow against it. And it has the life insurance component to it. So um, you never really have to pay it back. Hmm. That's what I, that's exactly what I was going to ask, because, of course, in most people's mind, when you hear the word borrow, you know, you have to you, your mind is, OK, I have to pay it back. So, hmm. for example, um, we just talking about life insurance or um, retirement. If I borrow. Forty thousand dollars for my retirement. Mm -hmm. As if I'm saying borrowed, I don't have to, you're saying I don't have to pay it back or if I have to pay it back, what's the, the, um, uh, time frame. Oh, if you're borrowing against your life, um, your universal life and it's, you know, life insurance and the cash value, you don't have to pay it back. And what happens is maybe there's less of the life insurance there available when you actually die. Yeah, that makes okay. That makes sense. So, you, so okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Most people don't think about stuff like that, though. Yeah, you don't. Yeah. Because I would have never thought to be. Oh, okay. Well, I want in Rayshawn's instance. I want a. I want a new car. <laughs> Let me borrow fifty thousand dollars for my life. Because you don't think about like you think about taking from um, from your retirement and things that you physically have um you you continuously have access to but your life insurance like in my mind my life insurance is in the back of my head in my head you can't take from that you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. yeah yeah so sticking with like saving and stuff like that what are some tips that you would give for savings i know i i've tried to um and it could be, you know, at the lower end of savings or even at the higher end of savings with like your 401k and stuff. But I know I've always seen like the little charts that have if you save, if you put a dollar on week one and then week two, you do that. And every year in my mind, I say, I'm, I'm going to do, do this chart. And I swear I have the same chart from like five years ago and I just never did it because I just can never remember <laughs> to do it. But I think it's a great idea for someone that is just learning to save or want to save? I mean, I don't think me saving $1,200, they may be good, but I'll just probably buy a purse or something. So might not be a good idea for <laughs> me to put it away. Just be a really big Christmas save, gift for myself. <laughs> but you save. That is the point. That is the yeah, point. <laughs> that, that is the point. So had you done that $1,200 a year for five years, where would you be now? You'd be at six thousand dollars, and you. I'd be at my be. down payment for my Range Rover. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, six thousand yeah. plus six thousand. Yeah, it's not earning a lot of interest. But here's where I'm finding the best place to save right now. 
is in retirement. And let me tell you why. So in your 401k, number one, you want to save the absolute most that you could get into it. You want to max it out if you can, because number one, your company's usually matching a portion of it. So that's like additional pay. That's free money. And then most 401ks will allow you to roll it over into an IRA. Mm -hmm. So you can roll okay. your 401k over into an IRA, let's say a self-directed IRA. And you can use your self-directed IRA to buy rental property buy other investment properties, different kinds of investments that normal IRAs don't allow. Um, hmm. So when, so- And then, and let me tell you how you get money out of that. So then the IRA is renting the property and the IRA pays you to manage it. Hmm. Look at you, look at you being able to pull money out of your 401k without having to pay penalties for early distribution. Oh, that's some okay. So Very interesting, right? So, um, again, we probably and I, I'm sure earthly you do, but we all have some type of um, uh, retirement that we're putting into. Mm -hmm. I know when when I was younger, I'm, I'm gonna go with my early 20s. I started putting, I started with like twenty five dollars every every paycheck. Mm -hmm. What yeah. do you think? Um, is there, is there a, a cushion amount, I guess, uh, that you should put in every, um, it, every it, paycheck? It, yeah. You mean into savings? Savings or retirement, whichever. Okay. So now retirement, you should put in the absolute max that you could afford to put in until okay. it's maxed out. Um, you can so max out if, your, say, your retirement? You, by law, you can only put a certain amount in. You yeah, can. And you can max it out at um, I think it's twenty seven thousand. I was just looking oh, at I it earlier. That, no Either, I don't, I don't, if you're if you're not over fifty, then it's uh, I think it's like nineteen twenty thousand. Yeah, but that's within that's, that's within a year, and that's a year. Yeah. Okay, so say right say it one more time. Uh, I don't know the exact number. I can look yeah, it, up it real is. Quick. But it's roughly 19,000 for the year is how much you could put in 19,500 or something like that, 19,500. I was just looking at it because I, yeah, it's weird. Look, I'm going to have to go and calculate some things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Typically it's I, like. I put a good amount in my, in my, in my savings. I mean, in my, my retirement. And I never thought, I didn't never, I never looked at that fine, pay, that fine print that says you at some point in time you can stop because. My head was when I start making more every year that I make more, I try to put at least an extra twenty five or fifty dollars in. Mm -hmm. You know, I add that on to it because by the time it's time for me to retire, I want a, at least a little bit of something. So let me tell you how that works. Your four hundred one k plan, putting money into it. Let's say you're in a twenty two percent tax bracket for federal, and how much is your state tax bracket? I don't know. Five, seven, six, I think. Really? So let's say. Oh, that's six. the sales tax. Oh, what'd you say? State, I'm sorry. State income tax. Or income tax. I'm not sure what the income oh, tax is. Oh, I don't know. Okay, so let's just say it's 6%. Okay. So then between the 22% tax bracket you're in and for federal and 6% for state, that's 28%. So by putting money into uh, a 401k, that's 72%. It only costs you 72 cents because that's not taxable dollars. The tax is deferred on that. So you're deferring the taxes. So each dollar that you put in costs you 72 cents. If, okay. if by knowing that, does that make it seem like, oh man, that's worth it. Yeah. yeah. I can put a dollar in and it only costs me 72 cents. <laughs> I'm here for it. Yeah. And then if you have, you know, depending on which your employer, if your employer doesn't right. match and all of that. And your type company of stuff, matches it. So you can end good. up with a dollar and four cents and it only costs you 72 cents to get a dollar and four cents. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, for, for our listeners in, in regards to savings, I, I definitely think it's a good idea if, you, if they can afford to do it. I mean, not everyone is... Mm -hmm. Is, is able to do it right now, but you know, whatever that is that you're able to save, I think it's a good idea. Even if it's like saving for a rainy day, saving for a home, saving for a car, 
Just whatever it is. I'm going to keep throwing out the car during these investment talks because I'm getting a new vehicle. Here's the other thing about that 401k. If you can roll it over into an IRA, Mm -hmm. you can take out up to $10,000 to purchase a home as a first-time home buyer. And you can be a first-time home buyer if you haven't owned a home in in two years. Oh, well, look at at God. You do. You have owned a home. I have not. I don't. I don't. No, no, ma'am. My last, my last purchase home was ten years ago. Yeah, uh, no, almost, almost fourteen. Yeah, probably more than that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if you haven't owned a home in two years, you're considered a first time home buyer. So you can take up to ten thousand dollars out of your IRA as a down payment for your to purchase a new home. <laughs> greater and greater. So just check the plan summary to make sure that your 401k allows for a rollover into an IRA while you're still employed. Not all guys, plans allow that. So always check your plan summary before you make your plans. That here's what I'm going to do. So okay. for people that are employees, those are some of the kind of tax strategies that I work with them. It's not just about taxes. I look at your goals. So what are your goals? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to buy a home? Are you trying to fund your children's college? Are you trying to save for something? Are you trying to build assets so you can create a legacy for your family? So I know when people think taxes, they like, oh, that's so boring. But tell me what I said today that was boring. <laughs> Not nothing. It told us how to save. Oh. Told us how to save and make it more money. It took a second to try to register some of the stuff, but <laughs> sounds sounds great to me. Exactly. So, um, what a what was my question? What changes can we? And this is just our overall topic. Um, question, but what changes should someone expect this year? I know we don't want to get into too deep of the jargon because some listeners would be like, wait, what? (laughs) Not a lot of changes from last year to this year, in all honesty. Awesome. So does that mean our... uh, That's good and bad for some. It just depends on the situation. (laughs) So does that mean our tax tax window is going to extend to June 15th again? (laughs) Um, you know what? It, de- it depends. Let's see how this Omicron does. What's happened, um, you know, two years ago, it, it went to July 15th. Oh, Last okay. year, it went to May 15th. So let's see what happens this year. You know, you know, they need people there to process it and to make it happen. Yeah. And if things fall apart, they have to extend it. You know, we were late, late starting to file last year. And so they extended it. They didn't have the forms ready. There were a lot of things that went wrong last year. We don't have all those issues this year. So it may not, there may not be an extension. You just, you may have to go on extension, but the filing time may not be extended. Hmm. I'm good good usually, uh, but, uh, you know, part of the conversation, I, I don't really, I'm not interested because I don't like Owen, so. But I will, I will definitely get it done. I don't want that headache. Oh yeah. So I just have a random question, um, and I, I asked this question because I, I was at work today, and someone asked the question. I looked up to to look at who asked the question. I'm like, you're too old, and I know this answer. But then it clicked. Like, not everybody knows how to do this stuff. Is there a basic rule to follow when filling out like your tax? Uh, the papers for work. So like your W-4s or your state taxes. And I say that, so I had a, um, a older woman in an orientation session today and got, everyone's like, you know, we're going through the paperwork with them, the documents or whatever. And she's like, I don't know how to fill this out. And so someone else goes over to her and they were like, is it just you? Is it that? And I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh, you can't do that. They're looking like, what's wrong? You are not her tax advisor. You can't advise her what to put on that sheet of paper. And she was so confused. She was like, I'm going to just leave it blank. (laughs) Like, you can't leave it blank either. But like your basic W-4 form, your state tax form that you're filling out for jobs. It changed a couple of years ago. It's very complicated now. It is. Before it used to be, well, you're single, zero, you're married to your whatever. Now Now you you have to go through and you just have to answer questions. So. If she could read, then you have to just answer the questions, and then it it's it's like a that it added 
for you. Yeah, it's like a maze and you just fill out the answers to it and then it, it moves on. You know, it, it's confusing to me. So in my office, my tax manager is a person that walks our clients through how to fill that out and what to put in. Cause they ask me and I go, no, uh, no, I'm not the <laughs> one. <laughs> it is very confusing. Yeah. That's, there is no simple way. I will, I will, I'm, I'm, I know how to fill out some of the stuff, but I will, I, uh, Rayshawn, I will say I'm, you, I'm you that person. People. I'm because <laughs> I would, I would literally call, hey, dad, like I said, he's my tax for Hey, what am I supposed to be? Because it's so, it's a lot. I filter everything to zero. Take it all now. Because I might, if I put one or two claiming some of these daggone kids, I might still owe. <laughs> well, like it doesn't ta- child tax credit doesn't work for, for my household so, so I, I was going to say the one thing that uh, I think a lot of people are going to see this year and maybe they've already heard about it enough and they understand that anybody that was getting part of their child tax credits from July through December mm-hmm. and they're used to getting big refunds part of that refund they've already gotten they've gotten it in advance so mm-hmm. they're not going to have all that available to them when they file their taxes this year. So oh, some people may find themselves owing because that child tax credit may have been the thing that reduced their taxes down to zero, but you would have gotten half of it last year. So that half is not available anymore. You've received it already. Wow. They always find a way to get us, man. Dang. They ain't get us because well, I ain't get it. <laughs> it was designed to help you. It was yeah. designed so that people got the money during the year when they need it. Yeah. instead of getting it all at once. And I know some people kind of use that refund at the in April as a, as a savings. It's like, uh, if I had it in my account, I'd spend it. So I'll wait and I get it at the end. But it's the refunds are going to be lower because of that. And, and I know there are going to be some unhappy people. I just got a couple hundred dollars every month. That's not much. Yeah, yeah we, a lot of people depend on it. Yeah, I didn't. I, I got. We got something from. Uh, was it June to the through December? But it definitely wasn't what. You know, probably most people got, and we definitely didn't get anything. Um, what was it? The the big the big lump sum. We didn't get any of that. So now that's my fear. They gave us no COVID up, relief. Yeah, coming up on the end, the tail end, they're like, hey. We gave you this four hundred dollars now. <laughs> <laughs> now you owe us again. I I just that's, be and that's a possibility <sighs> because that's people so fill out their W four saying they have these kids. So it, it when it calculates it, it calculates okay, you have these kids and you're going to do this. But then if you've already gotten the advance for having those kids in the year. Mm-hmm. then when you file your taxes, that advance is not available and maybe they didn't have enough withheld because you had those kids and they were counting on that. So I had one last question, student loans. <laughs> so student loans are still deferred mm-hmm. um, due to COVID. Do you think or do you know if there would be some type of um, catch-up tax? Like how would that look? How would, would that work tax-wise? And the, the second or, or additional question to that is, if you're able to, is it wise to take it out of deferment? Um, because it'll be a better benefit for you tax-wise. Okay, so you're limited in the deduction that you get for student loan interest anyhow, because you only pay taxes on the interest. Okay. Um, probably a smarter move if you, you've been paying student loans for a long time and it seemed that like, like, and it seems like that balance never goes down. Now that it's deferred, if you have the money, now would be the time to pay it down because the benefit you get from student loan interest deduction is minimal. Hmm. I mean, it helps, but it's, it's, uh, so let's say you're paying, I I don't know how much, but at student loan deduction, student loan interest, don't remember the exact number. I want to say that it's limited to like 1,200, 1,500, 1,800, something like that. So even if you paid, $4,000 $4,000 in student loan interest, you don't get a benefit for all of it. It's limited on how much you could take. And if you've been paying it for years and can't seem to get it paid down, now might be a good time to mm-hmm. make payments to get that balance down. But then you have people like me who who's waiting for 
Biden to say, you know, all. <laughs> I think you'll so, be waiting. <laughs> yeah, we'll wait um, yeah, that's like, a thought. Of course, they're saying, course they're saying that it's <laughs> going to um, the deferment is it. going to lift at the end at the end of uh, at the end of the month. So at this point in time, I'm getting multiple phone calls. Um, it's not. I, I, it's not the end of this month. It was deferred further. It's deferred to May, I think. It's deferred to May. Oh, they they no, deferred it again. That. They extended <laughs> it to May. Because oh in my mind, <laughs> don't judge me, Ursula, but in my mind, I promise you, I'm going to die with it. I'm going to go ahead and give y'all $5 a month. And I'm going to do what I got to do just so y'all don't take no money out much. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to die with it. Because you know, that's I, a thought. I, I just don't see them doing it i wish they would if uh, these students were corporations then yeah they'd be happy to forgive that mm -hmm. debt but these these students are poor and middle-income people so no they're not going to forgive forgive that debt hopefully they, a whole they lot do of some um but you can hold out and wait I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm bad with it. it's okay. so as far as taxes and the student loan interest um, the student loan interest isn't taxed. It, it gives you a tax deduction. So no big changes there. If you're not paying interest, you're not getting the deduction. By them deferring it, that's the only thing. And if you pay it, you're still not going to get a deduction right now because it's deferred and the interest is not accruing. Mm -hmm. So you would just be paying down the principal. And so that's not going to have a tax consequence either. So it, it doesn't affect your taxes. So I don't know, just my opinion, if you just want to get rid of get rid of some of that debt and want it to go away, it's not accruing interest now is the perfect time to make it to get that balance down low. Got it. Yeah, you know, they can hold on to my deferment. Defer it forever. For like, <laughs> like I said, it, it, it just it whatever. But, wow. Yeah, y'all can defer it forever for all I care. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's the yeah, but um yeah, one last question, Jim. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Is it better to file file separately, even though you're married, or file uh, jointly? It it depends. For most people, married filing jointly is going to give you a better better tax result. It's going to save you anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand. But in some cases, it may save you twenty eight dollars by filing a joint return. Um, in very few cases, married filing separate um, might give you a better result. But here's the reason why a lot of people file separately. So you have two spouses that have different philosophies or different attitudes about taxes and sometimes different situations. So if, if you marry somebody that has past tax debt and you don't wanna combine your taxes until they get that stuff straight or because they never keep it straight, they never get their stuff together, they never file on time, then you're somebody's like, I got to be in there right on time and file my taxes. You might want to keep it separate. And that's what keeps the marriage together mm. because it's you have people with different right. attitudes. Um, sometimes you have, uh, uh, there are any number of reasons, but typically it's a financial one and not necessarily a tax reason why people file separately. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a mental health thing. I, I can't deal with you and your situation. You know, I have clients that have um, spouses that do some risky business mm -hmm. transaction. They keep saying, I, I don't like the way you do your business. I don't want to co-mingle because I don't want to be responsible for your tax debt. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But so yeah. it doesn't catch up. So if you're you're married the whole year of course, uh -huh. and you live together. Yeah, you live together. All that, that all of, that doesn't eventually like no. catch up to you. No, your options are married filing jointly or married filing separately. What would be wrong is for either one of them to file single or head of household. If you're married at the end of the year and you live together, it's married filing jointly or married filing separately. Okay. Married filing jointly, married filing separately. Hmm. Those, are, those are your options. Yeah. Or if you're in a bad situation and you think you're going to get divorced, you better check it back. <laughs> Yeah, better fix it now. Fix it in a yeah. that, That's the other thing. If, <laughs> if you're planning to leave that situation and you don't want to be responsible, you know, somebody else always, your spouse always owes a lot of taxes. And if you did it by yourself, you wouldn't owe, then let's just 
Make it clean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, this was extremely informative. And I know I cannot wait to hear, listen to it back. Because I have, I, like, well, the listeners can't see my book. But these weren't even, like, questions. <laughs> these were, like, notes. <laughs> like, personally, for me. So... <laughs> I was over here like, uh. yes, and I know this is my husband is into finances and things like that. So I know this will be an episode that he will really enjoy listening to because he does not. And I know he'll hear this part because I'm not going to edit out. He doesn't listen to all of the <laughs> episodes, but this will be one that he will enjoy. So yeah. this was and good. This was really good. So thank you so much, Ursula. I do want you to. Um, I don't know if you're on social media, if you want to leave your social media handles for anyone to follow you um, or if someone uh, wants to reach out to you because they need a tax advisor or a tax expert. Um, just because she's in California, there is something such as Zoom. And nowadays, a lot of your mm -hmm. your tax advising and your meetings are held on Zoom anyway. So mm -hmm. they are. <laughs> Facts. I have clients all over the country. Actually, I have clients all over the world have clients in other countries so <laughs> amazing I love it I love so it. if they want to find me you can go to my personal page ursulagarrett.com and that has all of it's my what I call my personal branding page it has all my links to um, all my social media sites or you can go directly to my website which is cpagarrett.com awesome 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 and we will tag and put all of your information um, under the podcast so everyone can find you. We definitely, definitely thank you so much. Um, definitely appreciate your time. I know it's a big difference in the time zones here. <laughs> so always a pleasure. You. Thank you. Um, as always to our listeners, please make sure that you download the podcast on all of the platforms. We are all over. Um, you can also find us on Instagram at realities, and that's R-A-I-A-L-I-T-I-E-S. And as usual, in our usual uh, exit, as Bree will say, bye.